Alice Guy's extraordinary career paved the way for many other women filmmakers, among them Lois Weber. Alice Guy will always hold the distinction of being the world's first woman film director and studio head. But in an interesting twist of cinematic history, it was her husband, Herbert Blanchet, who launched the career of a young actress who would become the first American woman to direct a film and run her own production studio. Her name was Lois Weber. In 1916, she was the top director at Universal Studios in both reputation and salary. Her position in Hollywood was equal to that of any man. She was as controversial as she was celebrated. From capital punishment to birth control, Weber made films on subjects most people would rather ignore. Her movies generated enormous profits for the studios. Yet today, few moviegoers have ever heard of Lois Weber. Lois Weber is one of the most important of silent film directors. I'm not talking about women directors now, I'm talking about directors, period. She was a genuine auteur of the cinema, someone who directed, wrote, and starred in her own films. In a way, she's totally unique, not only in the history of the silent cinema, but in the entire history of American filmmaking. Throughout her life, Lois Weber was first and foremost a missionary. At the age of 17, she worked to save the souls of prostitutes and sinners in the brothels of her native Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Later, in Hollywood, she tried to help cure the ills of the world through her films. Like many women of her generation, Lois Weber was idealistic and passionate. She wanted to improve the life of others, to end child labor, guarantee an eight-hour workday, and win for women the right to vote. Lois Weber was also beautiful and talented, so at the suggestion of her uncle, she became an actress, hoping to turn the stage into her pulpit. As I was convinced that the theatrical profession needed a missionary, the best way to reach them was to become one of them, so I went on the stage filled with a great desire to convert my fellow men. At the age of 26, while on a theatrical road show, Weber met fellow actor Phillips Smalley. They married after a whirlwind courtship of just one week. It was considered inappropriate for married couples to work together in the theater. So when Smalley went back on the road, his dutiful new bride found herself living in a New York hotel, alone and out of work. Restless and bored, Lois Weber decided to apply for an acting job at the nearby Gaumont Film Studios. It was Herbert Blanchet, husband of French filmmaker Alice Guy, who in 1908 hired Lois Weber on the spot. His own wife was at home raising their young child while he ran the studio. And within a matter of days, Herbert Blanchet decided that Lois can also go on and direct those films. Now one can only surmise that as an actress, she proved herself so efficient, so intelligent, she was asked to become a director. It's not surprising that Herbert Blanchet gave the young actress an opportunity to direct. After all, his own wife had been one of the most successful directors in France for over 10 years. But here in the United States, only men were making movies. So Lois Weber made history by becoming the first American woman to direct a film. Her husband, Philip Smalley, soon left the theater and teamed up with Weber in the growing film business, where they were able to work together. Most of their early films have been lost. The Japanese Idol, made in 1912, is one of the earliest surviving and Weber can be seen starring in it. From 1911 to 1914, Weber wrote and directed one 10-minute movie each week. In moving pictures, I have found my life's work. I find at once an outlet for my emotions and my ideals. I can preach to my heart's content 
And with the opportunity to write the play, act the leading role, and direct the entire production, if my message fails to reach someone, I can blame only myself. In those days, the most talked about filmmaker was a daring new director named D.W. Griffiths, who was experimenting with extreme close-ups and quick cutting. Weber was also sharpening the technical tools of her trade, pioneering devices to tell stories in new ways. In the summer of 1912, Weber came out with her own cutting-edge film called Suspense. She combined the dramatic struggle of a woman, played by Weber, against a menacing intruder and an exciting chase scene in which her husband races to the rescue. Weber used a three-way split screen to create suspense as their fates collide. She's the first to use a triple screen to tell a story. So we have the same sequence of events as seen in three different locations on the screen at the same time. This is quite incredible. In the winter of 1912, Lois Weber and Philip Smalley, like many pioneer filmmakers, made the journey westward. Movie making was shifting from New York City to Southern California. Suddenly, a sleepy little village called Hollywood was invaded by filmmakers from the east. Carl Lemley was getting ready to build a studio called Universal, and Cecil B. DeMille would soon direct his first picture. Movie makers were attracted by the endless blue sky and diverse landscapes, ideal for location shooting. The Smalleys had been lured to run Rex Films, a division of Universal. But they soon left to head up an independent company, Bosworth Studios. Lois Weber, for the first time in her career, had complete creative control. So now this former missionary began to make full-length feature films that reflected her deeply felt beliefs and ideals. It seems that Lois Weber, not only did she realize the potential of the motion picture, but she also realized she could use it to her own ends, that she realized it was a propaganda tool. If pictures are to make and maintain a position alongside the novel and the spoken drama as a medium of permanent value, they must be concerned with ideas which get under the skin and affect the living and thinking of the people who view them. And they must have some definite foundation in morality, for certainly those are the things which endure. She dealt with subjects that were not discussed or considered in, in civilized company. She dealt with birth control, she dealt with anti-Semitism, she dealt with hypocrisy in politics and religion, she dealt with scandal-mongering in the press, she dealt with poverty, she dealt with issues that uh, I think most Americans would have preferred be swept under the carpet and forgotten. Weber's films may have offended many Americans, but they also were extremely popular. Well, of course, once you start making films on what might be called forbidden topics, you immediately have an audience. You're going to have the, the priest in the pulpit denouncing these films to his congregation Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. You're going to have that congregation queuing up outside the theater to go and see the film and see, find out what all the excitement is about. In 1915, D.W. Griffiths made history with the first American full-length feature film, The Birth of a Nation. That same year, Lois Weber released her own equally controversial blockbuster. It featured a naked woman to dramatize an allegory about hypocrisy. A young minister, struggling to deal with the hypocrites in his congregation, is guided in a dreamlike sequence by nude actress Margaret Edwards, playing the role of Naked Truth. Edwards had won a contest as the most perfectly formed girl in the world. This, of course, upset a great many people. In Boston, the mayor denounced the film and insisted that, um, that the distributor should actually sort of paint clothing the fame by fame upon the upon the naked figure. The New York Times proclaimed it daring and artistic. This long tracking shot over the faces of hundreds of extras was extraordinary for the time. 
The Hypocrites was a huge financial success, propelling Lois Weber to the top of her profession. Now Carl Lemley at Universal realized that um, Lois Weber was a major director. He wanted her back with his company, and so she was able to return to Universal in 1915 and to become its top director and its highest paid director. Lois Weber was given an unheard of salary, $5,000 a week. And in Photoplay Magazine's list of top directors of 1916, Lois Weber and Philip Smalley were ranked first, and D.W. Griffith was second. More and more, Lois Weber began taking solo credit, with her husband listed as advisory or assistant director. It's very apparent that Philip Smalley is not contributing anything to the films. The films might contain the credit directed by Lois Webber and Philip Smalley, but the films are the work of Lois Webber and Lois Webber alone. In 1916, Lois Webber took on another taboo subject, Where Are My Children, starring Tyrone Power Sr., is about a district attorney who believes in birth control and condemns abortion. The controversial topic assured even more notoriety for Lois Webber. Birth control was still illegal, the head of the Pennsylvania Censor Board banned the film, saying, the picture is unspeakably vile. It was another box office moneymaker, grossing $3 million. Universal set up their star director in her own studio called Lois Weber Productions. It was the first time a woman director had ever been given her own production deal by a studio. Lois Weber was the most acclaimed, but by no means the only successful woman director working in Hollywood. In 1916, there were almost a dozen, among them Cleo Madison, Ruth Stonehouse, and Grace Cunard. Other women were working as camera operators, studio managers, supervising editors, and screenwriters. Lois Weber produced over 30 films during the next few years, and in 1920, she signed a contract with a distributor, Famous Players Lasky, that would pay her an astonishing $50,000 a picture, plus half the profits. With this deal, Weber was at the height of her financial power, confident that the serious social issue films would soon dominate the movie market. Lois Weber was wrong. She had achieved fame and fortune by making films that fearlessly took on the controversial subjects of her day. Her audience shocked yet titillated by her daring. But times were changing, and so were the tastes of moviegoers. World War I was over. Women had won the right to vote, and the jazz age was in full swing. Weber's movies, infused with her passionate ideals, were suddenly out of fashion. After just three films, her deal with famous players Lasky was canceled. No longer in demand, Weber was forced to close her studio. And at a time when she most needed the support of her husband, after 17 years of marriage, he too was gone. He'd been having affairs with a number of, of actresses, um, Lois Weber knew about this, she'd been turning a blind eye to it, and she was desperately trying to save the marriage. But I think it's very obvious, obvious that Philip Smalley did not want to save the marriage. That summer, Weber and Philip Smalley were scheduled to sail for Europe, but she sailed alone. She divorced Smalley in June of 1922. Unfortunately for Lois Weber, without her man, without her husband at her side, she seems to have gone to pieces. Once Philip Smalley was out of the marriage, he disappeared. She seems unable to direct anymore. She locks herself in her home. She dismisses the servants. It's almost like she wants to become a recluse. She just simply wants to die. She, she has no contact with the outside community. There were rumors of a nervous breakdown and suicide attempts. After a few years, Weber pulled herself together and went back to work. She produced four more minor films during the 20s, and Carl Lemley gave her occasional script-writing jobs. But for Lois Weber, once recognized as one of the world's greatest film directors, the jobs were few and far between. To make ends meet, she began to manage a Los Angeles apartment building in which she'd invested. In 1927, she was asked what she would say to women who wanted to be directors. Embittered by her own painful experience, 
She replied, don't try it. At the age of 59, Lois Weber died from a bleeding ulcer. Lois Weber was not just a remarkable woman, she was a remarkable filmmaker, period. A real director should be absolute. He alone I hope knows. and pray for the recognition of motion pictures as an the art. The true artist is, and always has been, ahead of his time. If his art message is true, in moving pictures I have found my life's work. Those are the things which endure. Lois Weber directed 40 features and hundreds of short films during her extraordinary career. But like Alice Guy, much of her work didn't survive or was lost. Existing films were often credited to her husband, Philip Smalley. Lois Weber, once recognized as the greatest woman director in the world, quickly became barely a footnote in filmmaking history.